something more about him tonight that will count for all eternity. Now it's my pleasure to call our brother Jonathan Brower for what the Lord has given to him for us tonight. Brother Jonathan. Thank you, Brother Kendall, those at the back. Well, good evening. Let's open in our Bibles tonight to, we're going to start on a verse in Psalm 8, if you turn there, please, Psalm 8. While you're doing that, let me, I didn't want to say anything Sunday night because of TV and because of all the, I try to make it more formal and stick right to the word without anything, but I want to just take time now to thank you all for allowing my wife and I to be here. Uh, we appreciate coming here. We have, have for many years, and uh, it's just nice to be here. And your hospitality and your love, uh, we go home always better and bigger than we came. And so anyway, I'm going to blame it on you, not me. But anyway, we just want to thank you very much. It's hard to thank everybody, everybody. There's such a spirit of hospitality here. And, um, and if you see us out on the road or any place and you want to talk, just stop and let's have a chat. You know, one of the great things about getting old, uh, wait, wait, one of the great things about getting older is you don't remember things well. And I say that's a good thing because you forget the bad things as well as the good things, and that's a good thing. But for instance, like being here, uh, we go down to food fair to get some things for us and for the apartment. and. We go down and we come back and we do some things and then we remember we forgot something. And so then we go back to the food fair and then we go back to the apartment and that happens every day. So you'll see us in food fair two or three times a day. Don't think we have a job there. We don't. We don't. But it's a good place to meet people and if you see us there, well, let's just stop and have a chat. We want to... <clears throat> do something that I believe is very important, and you'll see why as we get moving through this. I don't know how many sessions the Lord will bring us through to get all the way through this, because every time I look at it, I see more and more and more. But I want, to do, I want to answer the second most important question you can answer. In Psalm 8, in verse 4, and we'll end up coming back to Psalm 8 probably another time, Thursday or Sunday, depending on what goes on. But right now, I just want to read one thing that David said and asked in verse 8. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that you visitest him. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we're thankful that we have truth available to us. Thy word is truth, it says. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. And so we have no excuse but to come tonight dependent on the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and no truth, and we're thankful for that. We don't have to live in ignorance. We can live in the light of your truth, live wisely and skillfully so that at the end of our life we will be able to have a profitable life to show by the grace of God. And that's what our desire is. And so we commit this time tonight, Father, to you, asking that you would speak to our hearts meet the needs that we have. Everyone is different, and your word can meet that need, and the Spirit can apply that truth. And so we totally and utterly depend on him tonight, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I remember hearing A.W. Tozer one time saying, I wasn't in the audience, by the way. It was a long time ago in the 50s. He recounted a story that he, when he was in Chicago at the church there, he had to meet a man in the city park. And he went down to the city park, and as he approached the park, there's a bench right at the entrance, and he said he looked at a man, and there was a man sitting there looking like he didn't know where he was, what he was doing, disheveled, just totally like something was wrong. And so he had to wait there for who he was meeting, and he sat next to the man, and every now and then the man and him would make eye contact, and finally he said to the man, do I know you? And he said, no. He said, do you know me? And he said, I don't even know who I am. And the man was honest. And he said he thought the man was pranking him, and he said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I don't live here. Well, where do you live? I don't know. He said, all I know is a few days ago, a couple of days ago, I took a fall, hit my head, and here I am right now. Well, what's your name? I don't know my name. Well, what do you do for a living? I don't know what I do for a living. And he thought the man was, he was getting frustrated and angry at the man because he thought the man was putting him on. <clears throat> And then all of a sudden, a well-dressed man, he said, with a little mustache came by and stopped and said the man's name and went running up to him. And the man looked at him like, that's my name? And he said, yes. Don't you know who you are? We've been looking for you for three days. He said, why? He said, you're a member of the Harmonic Symphony. You play the lead violin. And the first night when we got together and got ready and the curtain went up, we played the first one and it came to your solo and you were there. He says, I play the violin. He said, yes, very well. Now I give you that illustration because many Christians don't know why they're here. That's right. We get spiritual amnesia. I know one thing, unregenerated man doesn't know why they're here. They don't have a clue. And you know what? Unregenerated man, unsaved man, can ignore God, but they can't ignore man. You understand what I mean by that? You can say there is no God, you can ignore God, but you can't ignore you are a human being. Now tonight in a couple of these meetings, I'm going to be saying man, man, man. It is not the masculine gender. It is not at all. It means humanity, humanity. And so we go around today and the second, listen now, the second most important question is, what is man? The first one, you know what it is, don't you? What think ye of Christ? And there are many other ones underneath these two that are very important too. But one of the privileges that we have when we deal with young people and when we do camps and we do other things is to take away the fog and be able to tell them, why are you here? Let me tell you why you're here. You know, parents can say really many cruel things. You're an idiot. That's all you'll ever be. That's what some parents say. You'll never be anything worthwhile. And then we get all down because that's what they live up to. <laughs> when I had my brain surgery, I was telling somebody recently, uh, when I had my brain surgery about five or six years ago, um, and they took an MRI before the surgery to find out what was wrong, I went back to my primary care and sat down and she said, now Jonathan, before I tell you what we found out in your brain, I said, stop. What? She said, I said, before I tell you what we found in your brain, I said, hold it. Could you say it one more time? She said, what is wrong with you? I said, all my, my life, my mom said I didn't have a brain in my head. Now you tell me you found something in it. Now that's a joke, but I really did it, by the way. But what is man? Who are you? Why are you here? 
That's why many people get into the hippie movement. That's why I ended up doing drugs and being in the hippie movement. A man by Timothy Leary in Boston said, you can do hallucinogenic drugs and you can know God. Don't believe it. And by the way, as we move through our messages, you're going to find out that everything it appears and it's true that God teaches and says the world with the God of this world behind it will say just the opposite and, and show that what the world is made out of. And you'll see that I'm either going to be considered by some to be an ignorant, narrow-minded old man, or some of you are going to learn just exactly that behind the material is a spiritual battle. In Psalm 8, when he says, what is man? He had already in verse 2 said that out of the mouth of babes, you've ordained strength, that you might silence, that you might defeat the avenger, the evil one, the enemy. There's a spiritual battle going on. So God's going to do something, and then the enemy's going to do something, and God is going to set an order, and then the enemy is going to make the order reversed, and then God is going to talk about how important obedience is as being a human being. <coughs> Excuse me. And the devil will come along and say, you don't need to listen. You, it, listen, that's not important, 100% obedience. Just do the best you can do. And you'll hear things like, boy, it's good to hear your voice because God deserves any little bit you can do, do for him. Are you kidding me? I hate to wake you up this early in the message, but God deserves your best. God deserves what he, in his character, in his essence, and who he is, demands. Now, if we're going to live in this life and get to the end of our life and be able to look back and say, I've been satisfied with my life. I feel that my life is, has meaning and purpose. See, that's how I became aware of God at the age of 10. My father took a gun and took his life. He was 40 years old. And he didn't have a friend in the world. He didn't have a wife. He divorced her. And he didn't have kids. He kicked us out of the house. And the fact of the matter is, he had nothing to show for his life. And at 10 years old, I said, oh, God, if you're here, I want to know who you are. I know there's stars, and I know there's a sun and a moon, and I know there's a creator, but I want to know who you are personally, and I want my life to matter. Do you not want your life to matter? God wants your life to be full and rich. And Moses died, watch this now, full of years. That doesn't mean he lived that way full of years. It means rich in the years he had. Don't you want that? Do you want to get at the end of your life and say the saddest words of tongue and pen? Would have, should have, could have been? No, you don't want that. And so we stand in front of you. As I stand in front of young people at camps, and I say, you have to know why you're here. We have a brick in our home. Forgive me, honey. We have a brick in our home that my wife excavated out of Anvil Island in Vancouver, out in Howe Sound. It's from the Anvil Island Brick Company. You can't find them anymore. And there's a summer camp there. And so instead of looking for gold and making us rich, she brought a brick of clay. And it's pressed in that. And she took it home on the plane in her suitcase, just like we got stopped coming out of Israel because she had stones from every place we visited. And she took this brick home, and we have it in our house, and we've had it there for almost 20 years as a doorstop. Now, if that brick could talk to you tonight, it would say simply this. Put some mortar on me and put me in a wall, because that's what I'm made for. That's what gives me being. And so we, I know I'm belaboring this, but you've got to understand you can't just, as a Christian, slug through life saying, well, I'm saved and that's okay, and I go to meeting once a week and I go here. And you want to be the best at everything you do for the Lord, and you know that by the book, by God's will. Jesus is our example. Coming into this world, he said, I come to do thy will, O God. And when he went to the cross and bowed his head, into thy hands I commend my spirit. 
and he just did the will of God, only said what God wanted him to say, only did the things God wanted him to do, and that's the way, beloved, we should be too. And in Psalm 8, he says, when I consider your heavens, notice the personal pronoun, thy heavens. Who owns the heavens? Not us. Did you ever stop and do some research on all the people we've sent out in space and around the moon? They come back either deep in faith or loony off the edge of the end. I mean, really, just because man was made to be on the earth. The best, oh, I even hate to say this. I'll say it this way. The best saying I ever saw about life is this, live where your feet are. Don't live there, don't live there, live here. And in order to do that, you have to know why God made man. Because the enemy does, and he's the one who wants to, as 2 Corinthians 4 says, blind the, blind the minds by, and our eyes. He wants to blind us. He wants us not to see things the way we should see it. And so he says in verse 4, what is man? Now, but two things that raise this question. Number one, that you are mindful of him. You know what that phrase means? Literally, you have thoughts and intents in him. Now, one of the things I'm going to try to do as we move through this is stop and ask a question to, to make this very personal to you. Do you realize tonight, you might not feel this way, because the enemy will make you feel the opposite. Do you realize today, tonight, that God has thoughts towards you? Oh, nobody really cares for me. Even the elders don't visit me. I hear it all the time. And you know this and that. And I went there. and Oh, I did this for, for the church. And I didn't hear it. Listen, the devil wants to alienate you. He wants to deceive you. And it all takes place right here. And God says in Psalm 8, right off the bat, if you know what can answer what is man and what perplex them is this, that he would have thoughts and care about the purposes of David's life. God cares about you tonight. You can smile. You can say, thank you, Lord. You care about me. We sing it. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. I remember, I, don't, I can't even remember who it is. I, I guarantee it was a pinder. That's a 50-50 chance of being right. But when I lived in Miami and they, we used to have v visitors from this assembly like Lambert and Hazel and others come, there was a younger man about my age then, maybe even a little older, and he would stand up and his favorite one was, no one ever cared for me like, and he would say this, my Jesus. And I used to love to hear that. No one cares for you. Your spouse doesn't care for you like Jesus does. Do you realize, as a human being, the very fact that you have biological humanity, life, is proof that God loves you and has thoughts towards you? The only reason that you have the next breath, according to Paul, is it comes from him? So don't listen to these lies. Dig into your word. See what, is all, what, what your life is all about. And the second thing that raises the questions is this. And the Son of Man, that you visit him. Visit him. Now, that's an interesting word. It means to come with the intent of aiding or helping. Do you realize that? How many, how many times tonight in the prayer meeting do we hear Brother Gerald say, well, well, they saw the hand of the Lord in all that they did, that, you know, going to Nassau and all that. Can you believe that God would care about you? Yes, he gave me my biological life. Do you believe that God would visit you with the intent of helping you? Yes, he did it in Calvary. He does it every day. We just don't see it. Doesn't that make you question it? Listen. That's what the devil wants. He wants to alienate you and question God's love. Don't believe it for a moment. Don't believe it for a moment. Because from the very beginning, and here's where we're going to start right now. Genesis chapter 1. 
Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to find out how much God cares about man. Do you know in humanity we have so many advances in science, in knowledge? Do you know how fast knowledge has been acquired just in the last 50 years? Do you realize how much we know? I told you Sunday morning, we spent $680 billion to send a, a, play, a satellite with a camera out through the end of the universe. That's amazing. I could have read them Genesis 1 and 2. They could have found out what the answer is and said, gave me the money. I'd share it with you if they did, so don't worry. I mean, so many advances. And my point is, but yet we know very little about man, or do we want to even address it? And here's the reason why. It has to start with God, because he's the maker. He's the creator. He is the planner of it. In order to know what that is, what is that brick? If somebody came and said, what is that? I could give them the story. Only God if you take God out of the equation, you'll never know anything about yourself or man, humanity. And you'll say like the big answer they always give you, and it's this. We're just a well-educated animal. Don't you believe it for a moment? You are a being created in the image of God, made from mud. Literally, not dust, mud. And God formed it, as we're going to see in a moment. And, he, and when he got done forming it, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That word only appears, breath and then of life. That word breath only appears. In the English, it appears all over. But there it only appears for God. Do you realize he calls everything into existence and the things in the sea, and he calls this and out of this? But when it came to man... He breathed life from his being, God's life. Do you realize that? You're not just an animal. We got to get past this. And beloved, creation is so important. I almost spoke tonight on the importance in the Bible of creation. We're going to see it in Psalm 8. But you know, creation is so important, and when we contend for the faith, one of the, one of the things we're going to contend for is that God created all things. Hebrews 11, he spoke, and all things came into being by his spoken word. Isn't that amazing? Oh, I can't believe that. Good, that God is bigger than our brains, and he can do things beyond our human understanding. But once again, I'm going to drown this, drum this into your head. It just shows that you're not an accident. It shows you're not just something without meaning. Your thoughts, you come from the thoughts of God. Do you realize that? Man, I, I don't know why. No, and listen, we should get shake a few amens out of that. Listen, you're no accident. No accident at all. I've stood in front just, re just a couple of years ago in front of 200 kids, and a couple of them were crying. Because like my dad said to me, you're an accident, I didn't want you. Or somebody said, well, I heard you're born out of wedlock. And I heard you don't even know your parents. You were put up for adoption. You're an accident. And the devil's just beating and beating and beating. And I get to stand up and say, no, you're not. God's had you in his thoughts, you're no accident. He thought of you and gave you life and gave you existence and put you on this earth. And it's your responsibility to find out why and what, what is gonna take place. But if we take God out, we're in big trouble. So how then are we gonna find out why we're here? Answer, God's gonna tell us why we're here. It's called revelation. And in Isaiah 55, it's compared to rain coming down. As rain comes down from above and hits the dry ground, that's what revelation does. We only know truth because the truth is revealed to us from the one who is truth. And listen, 
He was there when he created so he can tell us what it's all about. Aren't you glad about that? When you look at creation and you see that big sunny ball of fire, you say, Lord, thank you for putting that there for me. Thank you for thinking about me. And when you see in the morning that clear water, and don't take any of it for granted, you know what God is saying? The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament is handiwork. God is saying, look what I've done to show you how much I love you. So here we go. We start our journey. You say, it's about time. We've already spent 20 minutes. And that's okay. It takes uh, a lot of time to get a semi going from a dead stop. If you've ever driven a truck, you'll know what I mean. Now listen, first thing we're going to do is we're going to divide the book of Genesis because I always found that it's important. You know, Paul told uh, Timothy about being a workman. He said this, rightly dividing the word of truth. He didn't say rightly interpreting. That's what we do today, rightly interpreting. I have no right to interpret the Bible any way I want. It's of no private interpretation. God has to reveal it to us. But we have the, the privilege to divide it. In my brain, believe it or not, I have one. My, uh, the only problem is they never took a picture while they had it open. And I wish that my doctor would have done that. But anyway, um, it, it works better with the divisions. So just like Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, the first book in the Old Testament has a repetitive phrase that appears and divides sections. Are you ready? Okay. Chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, is a section. And in this section, this is what God's going to do. He's going to say, look at the universe. Look at everything that dwells on the earth. And look at the earth, how it's made. And then he is going to say, now look at the king of the earth. Look at man. Do you see the picture? He starts with the Hebrew, the Hebrew language and the vocabulary. They didn't have a word for universe. They used comparative dual words, heaven and earth. Did you get it? In the day that God created the heaven and earth, that means everything that's made, right? And in verse 1, that's what he says. He said, look at verse, look at verse, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then in verse 2, he starts in with the six days of creation. The earth was without form and void. So he looks at all the things, then he looks at the earth and he says this, and then he turns and he says, now look at the king of the earth, man. How about that? How about that? We look the opposite way. We're here on earth, and we don't even look at man or ask anything about man or want to know man. And we look, <clears throat> excuse me, we look into space, and we look out to the end of the universe, and guess what? We do just the opposite of what God does in the book of Genesis. Isn't that typical? It's just typical. We must get put our thoughts where God's thoughts are. We must be accurate and think the way God has taught us and has recorded his word, because then we'll be on the right track. So anyway, look at chapter 2, verse 4. Are you ready? Here is the end, uh, the beginning of the first, excuse me, the second uh, block and the end of the first. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth. There it is. These are the history, and we'll talk about this at another time. This is the history. This is the family. This is what you need to know, and he'll break it off. Look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1, and this is the book of the generations of Adam. And so now we have another division, and now this is the this is the history of the generations of Adam. Adam just simply means man. Look at chapter 6, verse 9. 
These are the generations of Noah. And we just move right through 11 times the book is divided. And it's easy to find them. You can look them up using your concordance. 11 times you'll find where God says, now I'm going to start a new area, and this is a new generation of families. This is a new part of history. And so you learn what it is. There's another way to study it, which is an probably easier for you if you're going to learn how to study it. It's that there is a break where you can divide the book just in two. And so if it's easier, you can do it. Chapter 1 through chapter 11, we have the first division. And the first division is about four major events in history. Four major events. Creation, the fall, uh, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. And then something happens between at the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12. And from that point, the second half of the book of Genesis, you have four people, four men. It's as if God's going through all the genealogies and he says, now so-and-so begat, and so-and-so begat, and so-and-so begat. But then he gets to chapter 12 and he says, I'm going to do something different now. I'm going to have, I'm going to call a man for a people. And he's going to develop a people. And so he calls Abram. And Abram was from the Ur of Chaldees. He was an, from an idolatrous family. And he calls him out. We're going to look at him, one of these messages. We're going to look at why his faith is so important and why he's considered the father of faith. And we're going to look at why his testing in Genesis 22 was so severe. Absolutely severe because it was critical. And then you have Abram or Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and then Joseph. So you can look at it four events or, and then four men. If that's easier, that's fine. We're not going through the book of Genesis. I just threw that out so we can get going and get a little bit uh, of understanding. Now look at chapter 1 and look at verse 1. Now, I know tonight isn't as rip-roaring as it's going to be when we get into the actual meat of the messages, uh, but bear with it because it's really important to get a grip of this. We worked in our public high school for a long time. You won't ever hear creation mentioned. You won't, unless you have a Christian teacher and they fold it into their, their, their work schedule. And so this is something we have got to understand because the questions are going to come out to destroy this. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right there, created. This verse is just foundational to everyone's belief. Hebrews 11, 1 and 2 talk about it. God never argues his existence. He declares it. Beloved, beloved, you will never argue a person into heaven. You never will. You preach the word of God to them, and the spirit of God does some work. Just declare the word. Declare the word. In the beginning, God. Man, it's wonderful. In the beginning, God, Elohim, the powerful God, the God who can speak. And by the way, when it says, and God said, it could be audible, it could be written, or it can be thought. So it doesn't matter. Do you know God can just think something and it can happen? You'll never be like that, even though you're a child of God. You know, people say, oh, when we get redeemed bodies and we're in eternity, we're going to be just like Jesus and we're going to be. Well, there's some things you're not going to be like Jesus. I'm sorry. There are some of God's attributes that are transferable to us in, in glory, and there are some that aren't. But, oh, that's going to be wonderful anyway, isn't it? It'll be a wonderful time. In the beginning, God, there it is, created, created. And that word is different from the word form. That word is only found used of God. Bara, with a cow stem means only God. It's only used of God. 
God created. That's, you know, it, it's why David in Psalm 51 said, created me a clean heart, O God. In other words, he is saying, you're going to have to do it out of nothing. You're just going to have to create it. David was smart with that word. But listen, God created. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That, that tells us the whole universe. Now, the best way to understand the flow of the logic of this, are you still with me? There's a hush that up here. I can't hear anything but the air conditioner. I'm thinking I, maybe I lost you, some of you. If you think this is boring, you should have had to plow through it to find it. Now watch. The first verse talks about the expanse of the raw material, and it just makes this statement. God created it. Then in chapter 1, verse 2 through 2, 3, he talks about the details that he did it in six day and rested on the seventh day. And then you get into all these dialogues. And here's where the volumes of books come out. Well, you know, there was a gap theory and there was a fall and there was this. Interesting, they could never say gap truth. It's always a theory. But anyway, and you get all these things and dialogues of people saying things. And the easiest way to understand how God is teaching through this chapter is simply how a woman bakes a cake. Well, the heads came up. Who baked the cake? Did he mention cake? Now watch. She gets out the flour. Do you ever eat flour alone? It's wonderful, isn't it? No, you wouldn't eat it. She gets out baking soda. Wonderful, isn't it? Maybe even some sugar. Wonderful. I can eat that alone. Raw egg. Now what? It's all out there, and it's there. And it's without form and void. Get it? It's not edible. Without form and void means inhabitable. God is saying, it just like a woman gets all the ingredients, gets them all out and gets them in front of her, but it's not what he intended to stop at. He didn't create it to be that way, Isaiah says. He created it to be habitable. And so he took six days. Couldn't he have done it in one? Of course he could, but he's teaching. And on one day he does one thing, on another he does another. And we'll see this somewhere down the road, that each one of those days is exactly the way that God works to bring somebody around spiritually into existence. There's illumination, day one. There's separation, day two. There's fruitfulness, day three. There's ministry on day four. And you just go through, but God's going to, he wants to do this step one at a time. And he's going to use a repetitive form, one at a time. God said, it happened. That's the activity of God. It was good. And the end of it is at this, day one. And he's going to go through every one of those steps so that you can see when God got done with each step of making it habitable, it was good. Nobody clicked then. What happened? For who? Why is God doing these? In, why is God creating? You! You! And at the end of the first day, God saw it, and it was good. Thank you, Lord. You made it for me, and it's good. And the second day, he did it. Thank you, Lord. You did it for me, and it was good. And you go down, and you follow him through, and you follow how he just speaks, and he calls it out. He speaks, and he calls it out. And the fifth day is a little bit different because he calls to the waters to bring forth whales and swimming things. And then on the sixth day, he calls out different things. And on the end of the sixth day, listen, it ends with man. Why did he do day one? For man, the sixth day. Why did he do two? For man. Why did he do three? For man. Why day four, the stars, the work of his fingers? For man, for you. 
Read it. Go home. And at the end of that day, and he says it was good, and it was so, and you just say, thank you, Lord. You did it for me. And when you feel like nobody knows you're alive, and when you feel like you're being ignored, and you feel no one loves you, you just work your way through those and go out and look at the sun and say, thank you, Lord. And you talk to people and they say, man, isn't it amazing? That thing is putting off heat and blah, 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 blah. And say, no, no, I got something more amazing. God did that for me. Oh, he's one of those nuts. Okay. Yes, I am. I am. I believe. I believe that God created for me. He did it. What is man, David says, when I can, watch what he does. See, we'll see it when we put it all together in Psalm 8. When I see your creation in the works of your hands and the stars, I ask, what is man? Why are you doing this for man? You know why he also says that? Because even with all of that, man's going to rebel and sin. Can you believe it? You say to your child, do you realize all I did for you to have that? And the first time you touched it, you're broken. I had to work overtime. I had to use money from the food, saving for food. I had to spend 12 hours trying to read the instructions and get it together. And look what you did. Didn't you appreciate it? God is saying, follow the steps and realize this. You are important. Adam, Eve, you are important. God never created anything without loving it and caring for it. Put that in the bank. You say, oh, I would never get that way. Where'd the time go? I haven't even got into my message. I close with this. We had a boy. I know I've said this here, but some of you have slept since then, and if you're like me, you've forgotten. Some of you weren't here, so. We had a woman in our meeting. She's now blind and in a, in a help center and old, and she's not doing well, but she had a grandson. She had two grandsons, one, the older one. He got caught dealing drugs in Danville. And um, through that and through being caught and everything else, the Spirit of God really opened his heart, and he accepted the Lord. He was baptized, and he said, you know, I got to go to court, and whatever happens, I'll take it. I did it. I deserve it. I'll get through it. Good man. He goes to court, and they have leniency on him, and they said, you only have to go in for 10 months. The boy goes in there. I get word he's come out, but I don't see him at meeting. It's never good to not see some believer at a meeting for a long period of time. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I said to one of the men, <clears throat> David, we need to go by and see what, what's up with Matt. We got to make sure something, something's wrong. So we drive out there and we knock on the trailer. It's in the country. He has, he's on a piece of property with a trailer. And he says, who is it? And I said, it's John and David from chapel. Okay, hold on. And he opens the door. He invites us in. And we sit down. I sit across from him. And I said, now, Matt? I said, you've been in prison for 10 months. I'd have thought the first thing you would have done when you got out was come to chapel. Because you know what? We knew you were going to jail. We've been praying for you. We've been waiting for you to come back. I said, that doesn't change your status with us. He said, I said, what happened? He said, I don't think God loves me. I said, what? I, I don't think God loves me. I said, you got to be kidding me. How do you come to that conclusion? Well, I was in the lunchroom one day, and these two fellas jumped me with the trays, and they beat me with the trays. And in the process, I lost the tip of my finger on this, my index finger on my right hand. And I blame God. God let him do that to me. And he doesn't love me. I said, oh, you're judging it by missing the tip of your finger. I said, judge it this way. Look back to Calvary, the just dying for the unjust to bring you to God. Is that fair? Look at the cross. 
Greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for, your, for his friends. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If there's one thing you walk away with tonight, realize this. From Calvary all the way back to Genesis 1, God has been saying to mankind, I love you. My thoughts are towards you. What is man? Here's the answer in a short summary. We'll look at it in detail. I promise you we'll get through this. He's the occupation of God's heart and God's mind. Isn't that wonderful? God cares for you tonight. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, the enemy works in the area of the mind. It's his battlefield. And we are told that though we walk in the flesh, we don't war in the flesh. But our warfare is mighty. It's spiritual to the tearing down of strongholds in the mind. It's to bring every thought into the captivity of Christ because the evil one, the wicked one, will deceive and blind our eyes and get us to doubt the love of God and feel self-pity and to feel all kinds of wrong feelings. Father, how could we ever doubt the love of God to us? Your mercies are new every morning. The sun comes up and you say, here are my mercies. And the moon comes up at night. You are faithful. And the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, the handiwork. You say, I love you, I love you, I care for you. And then we look back to Calvary. And there we see the Son of God, the maker of the universe, as we heard Sunday. The maker of the universe as man for man became a curse. And all the claims of laws he made unto the uttermost he paid for us. But when we went astray, when we rebelled, he was the obedient one so that he could be worthy of dying. We sing, worthy, O Lord, art thou worthy to die. The only one who could die for mankind, and he did it. And he showed his love towards us. And so, Father, tonight we thank you as we start this little series and start moving to answer in detail what is man we thank you that you reminded us tonight that we are the occupation of your heart of your mind and your thoughts and you want to visit us with the idea of helping and enabling because you do visit us father we thank you for creation and for what it means we thank you for the love of god that passes all human understanding but we thank you most of all for your blessed Son, in whom all the promises of God are yea and amen. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.